across Africa. France 24's Rochelle Ferguson is here in the studio. Good evening to you, Rochelle. Uh, what stories are you looking at this evening? Well, to begin with on African news, we'll be looking at Sudanese protesters who call for President Bashir to step down following days of unrest over fuel subsidies. Rights groups allege security forces have shot dead at least 50 people. Tuareg rebels halt negotiations with Bamako's government, a move met with anger by Mali's new president, as hopes for lasting peace between the north and south are dashed. And it's four days later than originally planned, but finally Guinea's heading to the polls this Saturday for the country's first parliamentary elections in more than a decade. Hello there. The heads of several Kenyan security agencies have been summoned before a parliamentary committee for questioning over last weekend's siege at Westgate Mall. Some reports suggest security forces have begun pointing the finger over apparent security failings. Somali Islamist group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the attack in which militants stormed the wall, killing 67 civilians and several troops, remaining holed up for four days. Kenya's interior minister confirmed earlier that eight people are being held in connection with the attack, while forensic analysts comb the complex. But going forward now, with the foreign sick exercise beginning, I want to indicate that a number of our friends have joined our team, and specifically uh, from the following country, the US, Israel, Britain, Germany, Canada, and other agencies, including Interpol. With regard to the identity of the terrorist, we want to uh, request the public and the international community to allow the forensic undertaking to determine the exact identity of the terrorists. Next, Sudanese police today fired tear gas to break up thousands of demonstrators calling for President al-Bashir to resign. Protests followed days of unrest over fuel subsidies in which rights groups claim security forces shot dead at least 50 people. Sudan's officials deny the allegation, saying less than 29 people have died in clashes. They also insist the subsidy was unaffordable. While recent demonstrations have drawn over 5,000 people, the most for many years in Khartoum. I'm joined in the studio now by the former French ambassador to Sudan, Michel Rambo. Michel, it's lovely to have you with us. Good evening. Thank you very much. Can we start with it, with the first question? I mean, it's relatively new, this uh, protest within Sudan. Why now? Why are people taking to the streets more readily now? Oh, at first, uh, I think that, uh, well, Sudan is a country that has been very strongly uh, destabilized for a long time, and uh, especially after the peace agreement and that was signed in Navasha in Kenya in 2005, mm. because this peace agreement was a very deceitful and deceiving agreement, a peace agreement, for the government at least, because uh, it was supposed to maintain the unity of the country, and it uh, well, led to partition of the South, uh, and secondly, it was supposed to bring a lasting peace, and it didn't, uh, because it uh, brought, uh, anyway, a kind of, uh, well, uh, it transformed the, the civil war of before between the north and the south to a foreign war between the Republic of Sudan and South Sudan, and so it was very deceitful. And I think that the background of this, uh, well, undone peace uh, uh, was uh, unimplemented peace, uh, was, uh, well, oil resources and different, uh, well, questions, I think. Why? No, I don't know. Of course, uh, you have the context of the so-called Arab Springs, but I don't uh, like the word because I think it, there was nothing of a, an Arab Spring, neither in Khartoum. Michel, no, if no. we could just move on to the next question. Now, we know that uh, that we know that Al-Bashir was in power, since he's been in power since uh, a 1989 coup. Yes. How likely is it that these protests are going to, to overthrow him? Could he be ousted by these protests? Oh, I think, of course, he has uh, many other heads of states. He has been in power for a long, long time, maybe too long time. But I think that uh, he was re-elected in very uh, variable conditions and very disputable conditions several times. But I think this is not the question. I think that the question in Sudan, as it is in several other Arab countries, for example, because Sudan was not just uh, an African country, but also an Arab country. And I think that in the context of the so-called Arab Springs, uh, there is nothing to do with democracy and human rights. I think it is the question is about destabilization of the country. And the Sudan was targeted as such uh, a country to be destabilized for uh, 20 years uh, since, uh, well, the civil war in the Sudan. Michel, mm. former French ambassador to Sudan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Mm.
Now, in other news in Africa, in Mali, Tuareg and Arab rebels who control the north have announced they're suspending talks with Bamako's government, dashing hopes of lasting peace. The main point of contention is the future status of northern Mali, dubbed the Azawad by Tuareg movements. Rebels want autonomy, something the central government is reticent, reticent to discuss. The move to halt talks has angered Mali's new president, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Tuareg's seized control of Mali's north in March of this year. Following the overthrowing of the government, their actions drew worldwide condemnation and prompted France to launch a military offensive. Well, France 24 spoke earlier to the MNLA, the North's main rebel group, to ask why they're suspending those talks. At the UN, Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita expressed his anger after it was announced the rebel groups were suspending peace talks with the government. The confidence-building measures of the preliminary Ouagadougou Accord were implemented, so I really don't understand why the rebellion decided to suspend the negotiations. That is a blatant violation of the Ouagadougou Agreement. We called the MNLA, the main rebel group in northern Mali, and asked them why they were suspending the talks. There was a unilateral violation of the ceasefire by the Malians. The army committed atrocities against civilians. The military positions of the MNLA were attacked in Foita, and our political prisoners have not been released. The straw that broke the camel's back were the belligerent declarations made by the new Malian president. Cato recently said Mali's territorial integrity and its national unity were non-negotiable. It's that comment that irritated the MNLA. The Tuareg movement's long-standing demand is that northern Mali should become an autonomous region. Well, joining us now is Mali's Minister of Reconciliation, Sheikh Omar Diara. Mr Diara, thanks so much for joining us. Now, the rebels, the rebels' decision to halt peace talks must be a major blow to Bamako's government. No, it's not a blow to our government. We have been discussing with them uh, since uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we have informal contact with them. What happened to whether it's a surprise for us, but uh, I think it's not a blow and uh, it's not the end of uh, the process. Now, Mr. Diara, the Tuareg and, and Arab rebels have been asking for autonomy for some time now. Can you just outline for us why this remains non-negotiable for the Malian government? It's uh, uh, in written in the UN uh, uh, resolution uh, 2001 of uh, 25th April 2000, 2013, uh, the national integrity, uh, unity and the territorial integrity of Mali is not negotiable. So we are preparing now a, a meeting which will be held in uh, October on uh, how to uh, improve the decentralization uh, system we have here in Mali in order to give more power to the local, uh, local, local uh, uh, institutions. OK, Mr. Diara, thank you very much for joining us there. Now, it's four days later than originally planned, but finally Guinea's heading to the polls. The country's first parliamentary election in more than a decade are due to take place on Saturday. But as our correspondents Tatiana Mossot and Katerina Vitozzi found out, for some of Guinea's five million voters, it's still uncertain whether they'll be able to cast their ballot. This report from the capital, Conakry. A local town hall that's now an election hub. Hamdalaya Mosque's registered voters come here to collect their voter card. You have to look for where your name is. But there's a problem. Despite a thorough search, Malado So's name isn't on the list. Not on the list means no card and could mean no vote. If people are not on the list, we have to register them. An election organiser comes every evening with all the paperwork to sort out the problems. Malado has just turned 18, a child when the last parliamentary elections took place in 2002. She's unconvinced she'll be able to take part in this, her first ever poll. I'm worried. They can't find my name and the elections are tomorrow. They say I have to wait. I don't know what to do. Getting cards to voters has been the job of Guinea's Independent Election Committee. According to them, 92% of Guinea's 5 million plus voters have got their cards. Any problems have been dealt with as they arise, 
and there could still be hope for people like Malado. We might take the decision to look at the electoral law and see if it could create a space alongside the voting booths where people could continue to get their cards. One of our jobs is to make life easier for voters. Easier for voters who've waited years to pick 144 members of parliament. Finally, decision day is in reach as long as the cards here get into the hands of their rightful owners. Well, that's it. You're up to date with African News. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much indeed, Rochelle. Rochelle Ferguson there with African News. Just before we leave you, uh, some news just coming into us from Washington, where we understand that the US President Barack Obama has spoken on the telephone with the Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. Uh, that, if it's uh, confirmed, which it, which it has been, is the first conversation between uh, heads of state of the two countries since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. So more than 30 years since uh, leaders of the two countries have spoken. And uh, Obama is saying that he believes that uh, the United States and Iran can reach a comprehensive solution over Iran's uh, alleged nuclear program, which Iran maintains is purely for civilian means. We'll, of course, bring you more on that during the next news bulletin, which is in just under three minutes from now. Thanks for watching and do stay tuned to France 24.